Greetings from rainy and humid Washington, D.C. It's great to be speaking to you with a new association of friends today. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you. I want to start by introducing myself. My name is Alicia McBride, and I'm the Director of Quaker Leadership at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, FCNL. FCNL is a national nonpartisan Quaker organization that lobbies Congress for peace, justice, and environmental stewardship. We bring together tens of thousands of people, Quakers and other like-minded folks who share a belief in the power of relationship building to advance the world we seek. As I said, I serve as the director of Quaker leadership. I've held this role since May, building really on the work of Christine Ashley, who many of you know, to engage with friends across the country. But over the past 15 years, I've held a number of roles at FCNL including leading communications work, overseeing FCNL's 75th anniversary celebration, and assisting in strategic planning. To complete my Quaker resume, I'm also a member of Sandy Spring Monthly Meeting and Baltimore Yearly Meeting, and I serve on the Board of Advisors for Erlen School of Religion. So today I want to center my remarks around a query that's been on my heart recently one that seems especially relevant as we approach the International Day of Peace on September 21st, and as we're in the midst of real and painful conflicts about our country's direction and even its sense of identity. And that query is, what does it mean to be an advocate for peace right now? What does it mean to be an advocate for peace right now? I've been thinking about this query from three different directions through three different lenses, if you will. First, thinking about it in terms of systems, then in terms of relationships, and finally, in terms of history. So first, I want to start talking about systems. George Fox wrote, I told them that I lived in the virtue of that life and power that took away the occasion for all war. To me, this quote suggests that advocating for peace means working to take away the occasion for all war, getting at the structures, the systems behind war. So what does that mean? And to me, this means we're called not only to look at an instance of violence and try to prevent harm, although that's very important. It also means we're called to see these instances as part of a bigger system that is creating conflict and driving people towards violence. Part of advocating for peace is trying to change the system itself so that it doesn't create the occasions for war. I want to talk about a few ways that FCNL is engaged in this work from a systems perspective. Tell me if this situation sounds familiar. <clears throat> Some violent incident makes the news. In that moment, attention is rightly focused on how to keep people safe and minimize further casualties. Maybe you've been asked in that time, how can Quakers believe in peace when that just seems like doing nothing when people are dying. Pacifism seems to shade into passivism. And after a time, the conflict de-escalates, the city or the town or the country where it happened faded, fades from our attention until the next time violence erupts. To break this cycle, we have to focus not just on whatever set things off this time, but what creates that fertile ground for violence to take root. Conditions like poverty, inequality, corruption, and oppression. Before I go further, I want to offer a few qualifications. A focus on the systems driving conflict doesn't mean we stop working for peaceful resolution of what's happening right now. Tools like diplomatic negotiations, mediation, and aid to people who are hungry or have been forced from their homes are vital and life-saving. I'm also not saying that we should excuse harm someone causes or deny the responsibility of an individual. But I am saying that we can't only focus on the immediate problem. We also have to change the systems that keep peace from flourishing. This is why FCNO focuses on lobbying to put peace building at the center of US foreign policy. Over the past decade, we have worked to create and build up infrastructure to identify likely hotspots for violence and coordinate a U.S. response before people start dying. This is trying to steer the boat of U.S. foreign policy in a very different direction. 
but we've had some successes, including last year when the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act became law, something FCNL had been working on for at least a decade. This law equips the US government with constructive and cost-effective tools to address the root causes of violent conflict. We are continuing to push these efforts forward, even as we also need to address immediate issues and defend against increases in a militarized foreign policy. As just one example, we are leading efforts to keep US prohibitions on the use of landmines, which the Trump administration is trying to lift. If the US returns to using, developing, producing, and buying these weapons, it would be a significant step back for peace building efforts. On that topic, I encourage you to visit the FCNL website at fcnl.org slash peacebuilding. There you'll find everything you need to write a letter to the editor urging your members of Congress to reverse this landmine use policy, as well as updates on FCNL's work for systemic foreign policy change. This same interplay between immediate issues and pushing for systemic change is at work in all of the areas where FCNL lobbies, from nuclear disarmament to preventing war with Iran. And this isn't just about foreign policy either, or conflicts happening somewhere else. Let's go back to that cycle of violence I talked about earlier. An immediate crisis makes the news, something is done to tamp it down, but without changes to the underlying system, nothing has really changed. It's only a matter of time before violence erupts again. Doesn't this sound a lot like Ferguson or Baltimore or Minneapolis? How many people saw the protests after Michael Brown's death or Freddie Gray's or George Floyd's or Sandra Bland's or Breonna Taylor's or so many others and focused first on what those particular police officers had done wrong more than on the system that gave them license to kill these black men and women? Or they focused first on protesters' actions more than on the violence done to black and brown people in the United States for more than 400 years. I say all this fully acknowledging that these questions apply mostly to people like me, people who are white. Black and brown people in the US don't have the luxury of forgetting about those underlying systems that periodically boil over into a wider consciousness. And they should not bear the burden alone of changing these systems. But what is changing now is a wider focus, not only on holding individual officers and police departments accountable, which is unfortunately still pretty challenging, but on the militarization of US police forces and the need to reform the institution as a whole. What is changing is a wider focus on the racism that is woven into so much of our lives. So what can we do? I know many friends in your community are active in racial justice work and in working at the state and local level to break these cycles of police violence. Thank you for doing such important work. And I want to share three ways that FCNL is working with you to push forward these issues nationally. Many friends meetings and churches have approved minutes on racial justice. You can see some of them on our website at fcnl.org statements. These are powerful tools for corporate witness. Also on that same site, you can find out how FCNL can help you use these minutes to communicate with your members of Congress visit fcnl.org slash statements to find out more. Also, I invite you to join us in November from the 14th through the 17th at FCNL's virtual annual meeting and Quaker Public Policy Institute, where our lobbying will focus on addressing police violence. You can visit fcnl.org slash annual meeting to find out more and register. And finally, in partnership with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, FCNL is calling on Congress to support justice and policing and pass meaningful police reform legislation. You can find out more and take action at fcnl.org slash criminal justice. So I want to come back now to that query. What does it mean to be an advocate for peace right now? And I want to offer one possible answer. That part of being an advocate for peace means working to change the systems in our country and in our world that create and perpetuate violence. So we've talked about needing to change systems. The next question is how? Which brings me to the second answer I want to offer to this query about the importance of relationships. Advocating for peace means listening as well as speaking with the humility to know that each one of us alone has imperfect understanding. 
It means working to build the relationships that lead to lasting change. I remember hearing FCNL's General Secretary Emeritus, Joe Volk, talk about how peace was only possible through peaceful means, or you can't shoot your way to peace. That applies to policy, certainly, but it also applies to the way to go about policy change. It's hard to move people to your position when they're scared or angry. So what are the peaceful means of having difficult conversations? Well, it looks like listening to another point of view to try and understand and engage with someone and build trust between you. It does not look like agreeing to someone else's position or giving up your own values as a prerequisite to participate in the conversation. In other words, this isn't about being nice or avoiding conflict. You can love your neighbor without actually liking them very much. But it's acknowledging that it is worth trying to see that bit of light that is in all of us. If I can be forgiven for a moment uh, of sharing a non-FCNL resource, uh, I point you towards Network, the Catholic Social Justice Lobby, which has a really great training on how to talk to people in your life who you disagree with. I highly recommend it if you want to build up these skills. But how is relationship building important to lobbying? Many of you know, but I will give just one example. A couple of years ago, members of the FCNL advocacy team in Santa Cruz, California, met with their representative's office to ask him to support diplomacy with North Korea. His staff told him he couldn't sign on to the legislation because it didn't have enough bipartisan support. After finishing up the meeting, the team members started researching what the representative had done in the past. And they discovered he'd supported bills that were more partisan than the ones they were urging him to sign on to. When the group sent their thank you for the visit, they pointed out this inconsistency, not in a gotcha way, but as part of a continuing conversation on the issue. Two days later, the staff member called them to say the representative had agreed to co-sponsor the legislation. Now, obviously, there are lots of factors at work in this example. But I like to think that the constituents approach of treating their interaction with the congressional office as an ongoing back and forth probably helped keep that office open to changing its position. I know that many of you in the new association live in Indiana, and I know that you have a lot of practice in this kind of patient relationship building. I know you've worked very hard with Senator Todd Young's office, helping to build his support for food assistance increases as part of COVID relief legislation, although those increases have not yet become law. And I want to particularly recognize the work Welling Hall of West Richmond has done with Senator Young's office. In raising concerns around climate change with Senator Mike Braun, you've also done this work. That Senator is now one of the leaders in the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. And I know you've practiced this kind of relationship building with each other, as when the three Quaker meetings in Richmond met together this year to discern recommendations for FCNL's legislative priorities. I know this kind of relationship building can be messy and frustrating. Some days it feels like running into a brick wall over and over again. But I want to affirm for you that from the vantage point of Capitol Hill, it works. And the work you're doing in Indiana and elsewhere is some of the evidence staff give when people express doubts about its importance. For FCNL, this work to build relationships arises from our Quaker faith and the recognition of that of God in everyone. But also as our assistant clerk, Bridget Moikes likes to say, you don't have to be a Quaker to lobby in a way that respects the dignity of each person. That's just effective lobbying. And of course, right now, this kind of relationship building is happening not in person, but by phone or email or video. FCNL is finding that virtual lobbying has some advantages even over arranging in-person meetings. Some offices are easier to schedule, and so long as they have access to the technology, it's easier for people to join. A couple of years ago at FCNL's Spring Lobby Weekend, Representative Keith Ellison talked about how going into a congressional office is designed to intimidate. Now with congressional staff also joining in these meetings from home and juggling the same space and childcare and home office setup issues that we are all facing, this way of lobbying can be more equalizing. I know many of you have been lobbying and building relationships with your congressional offices virtually. If you haven't, or if you'd like some more support before you schedule your next meeting, FCNL offers a great live training on Tuesdays called Learn to Lobby in 30 Minutes. Check out fcnl.org slash events to sign up for an upcoming session. We also have an online guide at fcnl.org slash lobby from home. 
we offer lots of ways to support you in building the relationships that are essential for advocating for peace today. So we've talked about systems and relationships, and now we come to the last way I want to consider this query. What does it mean to be an advocate for peace right now? How can we look at that through the lens of history? When I was preparing for FCNL's 75th anniversary, I read the letter that the first head of FCNL, E. Raymond Wilson, wrote to accept his appointment. In November 1943, he wrote, we ought to be willing to work for the causes which will not be won now, but cannot be won unless the goals are staked out now and worked for energetically over a period of time. This perspective, that this is work for the long haul, gives another answer to what's needed to advocate for peace. Patience, persistence, and a commitment to a long-term vision. I've often thought about what it meant for friends gathering in Richmond, Indiana 77 years ago to decide to establish FCNO. On the one hand, it addressed an immediate need for friends to weigh in on conscription and aid in the middle of a war. On the other hand, it seems an incredible act of faith to decide to focus on US government policies at a time of such fear and uncertainty. It also shows a faith in friends in the United States their willingness to support the work of a lobbying organization, which cannot accept tax deductible contributions, although FCNL does have an education fund now, which does accept tax deductible contributions, and also for friends to participate in directing FCNL's advocacy through discernment in local communities. These orientations and structures are essential for the peace advocacy FCNL is able to do today. It's also that Quaker identity and approach that in turn attracts people to this work and connects them back to Quakerism. That is certainly my story. I first came to FCNL as a program assistant, raised as an Episcopalian and having attended meeting for a few years. But it was really the experience of seeing how Quaker faith and practice lived out at FCNL that led me to join the Religious Society of Friends. I know this is true for many others as well. And recognizing that this is a role that FCNL serves, especially in its young adult program, part of my role as director of Quaker leadership is to make sure that the people who come in contact with FCNL have a chance to understand and experience the Quaker basis of this work. FCNL is a place where people live their faith through action. And sometimes it's a place where the messiness of the world collides with faith in important and creative ways. Advocating for peace today means being willing to work over the long term and not shying away from the challenges that living out Quakerism in the world of politics entails. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak with you. I've shared a lot of ideas about how advocating for peace means being aware of systems and building relationships and learning from history. And now I look forward to hearing from you. What does it mean to you to be an advocate for peace right now.